All right, well, thanks a lot for, for, for coming everyone and God bless you. And uh, thank you for being here at this season. The holiday season has always been very special to the guys and the path work. And, um, you know, I found um, an audio recording of um, a guide session, Christmas Blessings from 1958, August, uh, December 24th, 1958. And I am going to send it to everyone. I just uh, transferred it from real to uh, digital. And I'm going to send everybody the MP3 file. Um, it's a beautiful lecture and it's a beautiful message. And it's, it's very interesting because um, just by way of history, the earliest circle around Eva was mainly women and mostly German speaking. And there was an astrologer named Walter Heller, who was very important in the pathwork at that time. And he's actually the one that gave my mother uh, her first lecture in uh, 1958, I think the same year. Uh, and uh, Walter Heller kind of directs the meeting. Hi, everyone. Hey, Kathleen, <laughs> it's great to see you. Stephen, how's it going? Good to see you. Uh, I was just mentioning this old recording we have of a Christmas blessing from the guide in December of 1958. And this was the MC of the meeting was Walter Heller, who was an astrologer at that time, who um, my mother to the path work. Was, was he related to Ann Heller? I don't think so. I don't think so. I've tried to find him on the internet, but I haven't been able to. Um, my mother tells a story that um, uh, she, somebody said, you've got you to gotta see this astrologer. And my mother was kind of skeptical. I don't know what you're talking about. Astrology, it's kind of like this and that. And so she went to see Walter Heller and he said to her, well, are you, is there a man in your life? Is there somebody that you're, you're intending to be with? Yes, I'm going to marry this man. That was my father. And he gives her, uh, he gives, she gives Walter Heller his time and date of birth and location. <clears throat> Walter Heller goes, oh, wait a second. This is not a good idea. This is not a good match. This is not going to work. Uh, I've got some real, there's a, you have to reconsider this. So then she goes home and she tells my dad, you know, um, well, I saw this astrologer and, and he, I gave him your birthday and, and your date and everything. And he said, it's really a bad match. And he said, you know, uh, Judith, I'm sorry. Uh, I lied to you about my age. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I made myself a, a year, a year older than I am. So she brought it back to Walter Heller and then said, oh, this is a great match. This is fantastic. <laughs> That is so you like that? That is so funny. So common too. So um, this. But usually people make themselves younger. Yeah, that's true. This message, uh, four years older than my mother's, four years older than my dad. Oh, that's why she you was. Made it your yeah. Life. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, in this lecture, first of all, Eva speaks French in the beginning which I guess was de rigueur at the time, you know, French being a cosmopolitan language that educated Europeans were supposed to speak. And there were some French people there too. And she mentions everyone who's there. And that includes Walter Heller and Mariana Scura, who was also with Eva, one of the people that first, uh, well, she was the first helper. Um, anyway, I will send this recording to everyone. And uh, it's beautiful uh, and it's interesting to listen to. Um, okay, and later on, we're going to also talk about, there's some automatic writing that Eva did, guided writing that I sent to everyone, and some of our, of our, our folks, um, we transcribed it or deciphered it, and Kevin did an excellent transcription, de decipherization, and so did Hava from Israel, uh, and, and so did um, Rita, Rita Selby. Uh, so we're going to talk about that later. Thank you. All right, now let me just jump into our lecture a little bit. Uh, limitations <clears throat> created through illusory alternatives. This is, as, as Tracy said to me earlier, it's a deceptively simple lecture. It seems simple, but it's actually very complicated and I think has a lot in it. Not only is there the guide's disquisition about effort, you know, the importance of effort and the fact that effort becomes effortless um, which would be nice, but we can feel it sometimes, you know, this whole lecture, just as so many other lectures are, is, um, how would I say it, this lecture is um, 
it invites us to, through the process of self-facing, to experience the unitive process or dip into the unitive process, give up some of what the guide calls the either ors, which are the dualistic consciousness, you know, zero sum game, what's good for me is not good for you and vice versa. Um, it's either black or white. I'm either happy or I'm sad, all that stuff. The guide invites us to experience the unitive state. I sometimes feel like um, I, I have a science fiction-y feeling that the guide, it's sort of like a transmission from another star. And I feel like our DNA is being rearranged and reabsorbed and somehow we're being called to rec recollect something that we once knew. And slowly, slowly by all this work of self-facing, we are able to transform ourselves and realize more things. And of course the path work is about raising consciousness and raising consciousness is what we're all here to do. And I have a good feeling that everyone in the world is here for the same reason, really, to raise consciousness. Um, you know, in other words, uh, to take a couple of simple examples, um, you know, the Incredible Hulk, whenever he gets angry, he has to destroy something. So that's like a misconception about anger. It's an image. If I am angry, I have to destroy something. In the path work, we know that we can express anger without having to destroy anything, right? Um, interesting also that um, reality itself, this lecture, the whole idea about illusory alternatives, fences that we put up, um, that the guide says on page one, the fences could be instantly removed with one gesture. Yep. Now that, that seems amazing when you think about it. And you know, there are so many transformative messages like this in religion also. You know, like I was with a bunch of black ladies from different transit unions today, and many of them were talking about God and they're talking about, uh, you know, salvation. And, and someone says, you know, I know that if I just believe, I just believe all my sins will be forgiven immediately like that, right? So, you know, the guide says, the fences could be instantly removed with one gesture. But I think this is another attempt to penetrate our consciousnesses, our psyche, with the idea of unity versus duality. On another level, it can be released or revealed or changed just like that. Not on the level we mostly are at, right? So reality is something that um, we see darkly, you know, we see as through a glass darkly, right? As in as St. Paul would say. <clears throat> Uh, it's funny because even when you talk about when, like the guide says, okay, page one, in reality, the universe is wide open and all human beings can move freely in it. The universe is truly at your disposal with its infinitely rich variety of experience, fulfillment, and energy. Um, however, due to a number of circumstances, you simply do not realize this fact well, I mean, this is true for everyone, right? It's true for someone who's being shelled in Ukraine, right? They're still imprisoned by imaginary fences, aren't they? And real um, ones, yeah. But and yeah. real ones too. Yeah. But you know, it's also true that if we conceive abstractly of the suffering that someone is undergoing, <clears throat> we can't really grasp it. We don't know about the suffering of another person and whether it's also penetrated by joy in some ways. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. That's intentionality, right? That's what the guide would call intentionality, positive intention. So the guide says, page one, we don't want to remove the illusions that we surround ourselves with. You could open your eyes and start moving out, yet you're afraid to try. You may listen, but dare not do what is necessary to move out into the great and safe freedom. You fear the freedom and rather choose unnecessary suffering. Now that's, of course, a key uh, concept in the path work. And, you know, all over we see people that choose unnecessary suffering, right? That they choose to suffer even though they could avoid it or make better choices. You know, sometimes I think that the only prayer that's legitimate to make for another person is that they may make good choices, right? Because the guide 
condemns or, or doesn't say into intercessory prayer is effective or it works. You can't pray for something to be given to you that you don't create yourself out of your own effort. So maybe the right prayer for people is to pray that they may make good choices. And then I think it is true that one can send blessings to another person, one can send good energy to another person. And that happened in many of the guide sessions at the end of the lecture where the force, the force yeah. was given to people um, who were at the, in, the, in the meeting. All right, so with respect to this desire we have to, to choose suffering, well, why do we do that? Uh, page two, guide says, basically we don't wanna recognize the power that we have. We want, we have an idea of helplessness that we are wedded to, um, that we are helpless. Guide says, number one, you have to discover you've realized your far reaching sphere of influence. When a person finally recognizes the significance of cause and effect in his or her own life, the result is a tremendously changed attitude to life. So, and then the guide says in the next paragraph, um, something that seems pretty commonsensical that, you know, we kind of putter around and waste our energy. We don't really realize that if we really focus on the things that we want, we can obtain those things. We are in a sense um, cheating ourselves of the energy that we have, the strength that we have, quote, you could have what you want if you spent your energies not on make-believe, but on truly obtaining it. So, you know, the guide is kind of a taskmaster, you know, the guide is Western concept of effort and action, activity is necessary to transform the guide, you know, we don't wait, although that is another aspect. And I'm gonna talk about that later, about the different ways that one gets to the higher self. But the guide says, this is an active path primarily. There is room for meditation and drawing in the energy from outside, from beings that are helping us or other people, but it's mainly a path, I believe, of activity and personal effort and struggle. Um, so the guide talks about um, the fences and about what he calls walls in the maze. This is kind of complex, really. On page two, the reasons, the, our beliefs that imprison us. Number one is your belief that you cannot have what you so easily might have. The second one is your shame about a non-existent and unnecessary deprivation. The third is the pretense that you have what you have what you want or could have it if you wanted to while you believe the opposite. So those are complicated kind of convoluted psychological traps that we are engaged in. They're all based on limitation. Right, and I think that that's something that we should probably explore and talk about a little bit because it's complicated. Uh, at least that's a complicated uh, paragraph, but this is common to many of the lectures, you know, that, that there are these twists and turns where the negative appears positive. For example, the guide says, um, whatever you experience, you unconsciously want, right? The good things and the bad things, you want them. You even fear yourself, your unconscious mind. as though it contained a monster you have no control over. You foolishly seem to assume that pretending it doesn't <clears throat> exist, it will remain tame. But if you looked at it, it would act up, forcing you into actions you have no way of stopping. You completely forget that your unconscious mind is the monster, that once the unconscious is conscious, you are not a slave to it, but it's master. So here we have a statement which incorporates another core concept of path work, namely bringing the unconscious conscious. Um, and the guide of course says that we don't have to be afraid of that, of the process of doing that because we have our friends here that we can do it with. We have our brothers and sisters who we can explore the unconscious and the dark side with. <clears throat> and if we don't explore it, it's like the proverbial iceberg. It runs our life, it runs the show. 
nine tenths of it, the gravity is, belie- is mm. beneath the surface. It mm. guides our life until we make it conscious and then we can step in and, and guide our lives more than our unconscious. So the guide again says, and this is, you know, as I mentioned, the kind of active emphasis of the guide, top of page three, you have to forcefully assert that you and you alone determine your actions, your behavior, your decisions. The moment you do this, something begins to happen within. And heretofore unused faculties begin to manifest, first giving you still deeper understanding and then strengthening you so that you begin to act in a new and more productive way and are geared to accomplish your goal. In other words, you set new causes in motion by refusing to be the prey of your own destructive aspects. So as we've noted many times, you know, the activity of self-facing, the activity of raising consciousness and trying to discover more of the unconscious, that activity sets something very powerful and good in motion. It's not the ego, it's not intellectual. It's something that kind of happens to you and transforms you. And then he says, when you finally come into your own and discover that the solution is so simple, a major transition occurs. Now, what is that transition? That transition, the guide says, depends on doing your best rather than giving the best impression. So all of us, you know, who have idealized self images, we have to let it go because uh, enough already, we're not fooling anyone. Not even ourselves. Not even ourselves. (laughs) You know, and the funny thing about it is, is when you, you're not even fooling other people. When you think you are, Mm. you're not fooling anyone. But when you, when you don't, (laughs) exactly, right? When you don't give the effort, when you give the effort for what the guy calls appearance values, um, everyone knows it, Mm. you can't hide it. Mm. And uh, as you know, the change lies in doing your best rather than giving the best impression. Now that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? All right. If you look at all your past discoveries in that light, you can determine the vast difference between giving the best impression so that the best will be thought of you and actually doing the best in order to obtain a particular desired result. Um, So this is the very key that determines the real success you want in a vocation, in a rewarding relationship, in growth and in self unfoldment. So in other words, letting the ego go. In other words, sacrificing ego. In other words, um, letting your higher self out. But you can only do that if you let your lower self out first and you explore the lower self, you explore the unconscious and you bring the other portions of the iceberg up so that the sun can melt the iceberg. Yeah, to pick a metaphor. Mm. Um, All right, so let's go back to what I talked about earlier. Later on, he says on page three, why why aren't we doing that? Why is it that we still create these fences around us? It is important in this connection that you discover A, the feeling of helplessness, vague hope and fear that something should or should not happen while not seeing how you influence it, be the exact cause of your unfulfillment, how you act as a consequence of your misconceptions and images, how your negative emotions make you react. All right. So then again, at the end of this page, the guide talks again about the active engagement. He says, you often say, I have a resistance letting it go at that. It seldom occurs to you to to add, here is my resistance. Now I know and see it. Now that I know and see it, I reject it. I will not, I do not give into it, regardless of what I ignorantly and erroneously fear. I wish to penetrate behind the resistance. I am in power, not my resistance. That's a key right there. That sentence. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I am in power, not my resistance. And that's an affirmation. (laughs) <laughs> my will for truth and growth is in power, is mm. real, and not my vague childish fears that cause, my, cause the resistance. 
Another prevalent attitude expresses, quote, I'm afraid of being rejected. I just hope for the best, but I'm afraid for I feel powerless to influence others to like me. Hmm. Yeah. But of course, people like you when you tap into your higher self. Well, maybe some people don't like you when you do that. But the higher self of their likes you. You may be rejected by being truthful <clears throat> and letting the divine manifest. Some people may not like that. But a part of them that responds, that, that part of them likes it. That's the Gandhian concept, right? That the, the inner self, the higher self of one person always responds to the higher self of another. You have an innate value that's longer term mm -hmm. than the short term mm -hmm. ego decides. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So getting close to wrapping it up. Guy talks about not cause and effect. Um, we have to look at cause and effect and realize, he says, All is necessary is seeing what there is to see that even your dearest and nearest know, but dare not tell you because they rightly feel you may be hurt. Um, that's, of course, what we had talked about before, you know, that your own suffering or your own misconceptions are obvious to others, mostly. Then the guy talks about effort. This is a very key thing in the Pathwork lectures, that effort is necessary to get the good things in life. Effort and sacrifice, I think. Those are the two things. And the sacrifice to a great degree is the sacrifice of letting the ego go, letting the dualistic concept of the, you know, of creation go. Your idea that it has to be either or. So, you know, the sacrifice, and of course, as the guide says in the lecture, the abyss of illusion, the sacrifice appears to be great to the ego, but it's really not that great. When you sacrifice and you let go, you find yourself floating instead of suffering. It's the ego that creates the suffering. It wants right? to live on. It wants to live on, that's yeah. right. So the guy talks about, as I mentioned earlier, that effort um, is not really effort when you are in it in the unit of state. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone that's an athlete knows that. Right. I mean, if you really put out an effort, you're running, you're swimming, you're working out. At some in some way, the effort is not an effort. It's, <clears throat> it's pleasure. And it helps you. It, it generates something positive. So anytime the effort is painful and constricted, you maybe are, should look at what it is you're putting effort into. And if the effort is not to transcend the duality, and to let the ego go, maybe the effort is mis being misdirected. I think that's what the guide means when he talks about later here. Effort against one's will in order to conform, to get approval or ward off disapproval, or just to survive creates resentment and fatigue, and thus causes greater resentment by making every further effort even more laborious. Free and voluntary effort accepted in fairness never makes one tired. Then the guy talks about question your soul movements. Yeah, that's very interesting. And Eva wrote something about that that I'm gonna share with you guys later. Um, effort, the voluntary effort has to be exerted first by the self to generate sufficient momentum so that it becomes free flowing. When this is happening, all blocks, all problems, all fences can be removed with the greatest of ease. So, you know, you've got to put on your raincoat, you've got to walk through the rain and get to the gym. Then you can enjoy working out. Is that a good metaphor? All right, now then the guide on page six talks again about images, key core concept of path work, the misconceptions that we have grown up with in life that mold our experiences, that mold what we encounter in life, how we relate to people. Any wrong conclusion points to a limited concept of life, creation, the universe, and the self. You suffer because you believe suffering is necessary and inevitable. If you believe that you must bleed, you will cut yourself. 
I mean, Tracy, don't you think, isn't it so that any image involves suffering? I think, I think it does. Yes. There's right. always suffering yes. in, in any image, misconception. Um, and then the guy talks about the either ors, three either ors, which are attitudes that gravely and falsely limit spiritual reality. Um, this is an ongoing theme in, in the lectures. Um, number one, if something is good, everything is, then, then it's either good or bad. Everything is either black and white, right or wrong. Um, there are always two equally undesirable alternatives. Neither possibility, no other possibility seems open. Another either or is a feeling or conclusion that reality is limited. And that when you see clarity in an issue and you consider it merely from the point of view of right or wrong, good or bad, this is a shallow and insufficient evaluation, leaving out many aspects of importance, many considerations of reality that cannot be found on the narrow level of either or, the scope and depth of reality is much wider. Now there's a couple of interesting uh, passages now which bear on the concept of fake news, which I mentioned last time. I mean, when I say fake news, I'm not joking about it. I, I mean, I think a lot of quote unquote fake news is because people accept easy answers. They want answers that are not sufficiently explored and thought about. The guide says, adopting views and standards without questioning and probing, without getting to the real issues or even the will to see what is really important and true stems from the concern to gain approval, ward off disapproval, and not from a sincere concern for the issue itself, right? So I mean, how many people get caught up in conspiracy theories because they wanna be approved of, or they wanna get on board with, with something? They don't take the time to question and probe things without going to the real issues. And of course, the guy talks about a sincere concern for the issue itself. You have to be dispassionate when you explore issues and see and be concerned with the merits of the issue, not what somebody else thinks about it. Um, the guy talks about another either or. Um, which I think is similar to what he said earlier choice between two equally undesirable alternatives. Notice all the either ors are based on limitation. Yeah. Wrong conclusions are always the result of stale, stagnant, obsolete ideas that remain unquestioned. If you dare not question your own taboos, you cannot widen the horizon of your life and discover that there are so many beautiful possibilities. Yeah, the guide speaks very strongly in this lecture about really sussing out reality, finding out what you believe. I mean, the guy does often says in other lectures that, you know, you don't need to conform to what society says you should conform to. He says in this lecture, you cannot step beyond the fence unless you discover that you are a free creature with self-responsibility. Part of this is the willingness and eagerness to question all doctrines, rules, regulations, and opinions handed down to you. Such questioning must be done thoroughly and independently, deeply probing into the truly important questions of living and growing. You must refuse to accept a view unless you yourself have arrived at its validity. <clears throat> so the guide often talks about the importance of looking at the concepts in the lectures, in terms of how it relates to your immediate reality and not accepting them at face value, just because they're in the lectures or because the guide put these concepts forward. Um, we can't be lazy, right? Uh, intellectually. You must learn to delve into yourself to summon the necessary resources and strength from within in order to obtain what you wish. If you declare that you wish it and want to establish the necessary precondition within yourself, the answer, must come from your higher self. All right. At the end of page seven, 
God says suffering is unnecessary. That is a big statement, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that kind of penetrates to the idea of what is suffering? What do we know that suffering is? I mean, is suffering the ego when you identify with something that brings you suffering? You identify with a dualistic perception, then you suffer, right? Sounds a little Buddhist maybe about attachment. Um, but the idea that suffering is unnecessary is, is kind of mind blowing really. You know, you drill down into what suffering is and when one feels suffering, what it exists in. I mean, I always tell my friends um, <laughs> at work, you know, I probably get fired. Um, I say them, I say things like, um, you know, like I would deal with the transit system and I say, hey, look, you know, if a bus driver gets assaulted, you know, that's not the worst thing because if you're if you're hurt as a public servant and you're doing something righteous, you're taking people to and from and someone steps up and smacks you, hits you, that's regrettable. But in terms of spiritual truth, you know, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a stain on them spiritually. Something even worse is betraying someone, lying to them. Uh, spiritual corruption is worse than being assaulted. So, but you know, Amazing. they might fire me for that. But yeah, just you've said it between though. us. Wow. Yeah, I mean, like they sometimes, wow, they listen, but yeah, because obviously, true, you know, that, that kind of suffering, if somebody hurts you, is very different from the kind of suffering that, that you engage in when you betray somebody or when you lie or when you, when you, you don't give of yourself, right? You don't give what you can. That's a very interesting kind of suffering. You know, when you don't give what you have the ability to give, to actually, that, that weighs on the conscience when you have the ability to give and you don't, right? All right. So then again, let's just wrap it up. Um, page eight. Now the guy talks about self-responsibility again. Self-responsibility, it means to be aware that your freedom is not interfered with, that you are a free creature, even before you become conscious of your own strength and freedom. That's something to think about. Um, we are all free. However, caveat, right? The consequences of your past ignorance have to be accepted, but only as long as you persist in retaining the particular ignorance or misconception that has created the suffering so maybe if people work together to create a totalitarian system like North Korea, where there, where so many people are starving or they're in prison, you know, they're, they've taken their freedom away, but they've done it to, to collectively, I think, maybe. The consequences of your past ignorance have to be accepted. Ignorance of, of some of the spiritual laws which enabled you to be imprisoned, not only personally, but also in your society. The moment you truly decide to change, and that requires the courage of ruthless self-honesty, the past negative cause dissolves, and you feel the inner freedom to express happiness, to fully desire it without tension, without urgency, without guilt, without fear of unhappiness. So somehow, when you truly decide to change, he says, the past negative cause dissolves. Now that I think is what the guy means when he talks about molding soul substance. You commit yourself, affirm that you have the capacity to change in a particular way, that you want to grow in a particular way. And then all of a sudden, the negative thing, it dissolves. You become hooked into a positive uh, circle, virtuous circle. Um, yeah. So then the guide, last paragraph talks about the need to trustingly express your will for, for your wish for fulfillment in the knowledge that this is in keeping with spiritual, spiritual reality. Thus you build a new condition. Such expression of trust is possible after experiencing again and again your true selfhood and its results as opposed to self-imprisonment and its results. So here again is what I call justified faith. In other words, when you, when you do the process of self-facing in the path work, 
you find that it does produce results in your own life. You find that tangled relationships become untangled. You find that love exists where you didn't think it was. You find that you don't have to work so hard to be approved of because people approve of you anyway. And then because of those recognitions and realizations, then <coughs> you're able to trust more and to trust this process. The trust you send out must come back to you. You will deeply know without a doubt that as your limited concepts bred their limited results, so your expanded concepts of the abundance of creation will breed correspondingly its own rewarding fulfillness, fulfillment. This knowingness is a ray that reaches out and must come back in fullness. Um, yeah, so I think that to recap uh, what I said early in the beginning is that this kind of spiritual ray of unity is something that's beckoning to us through these lectures, you know, that permeates us and that, that seeks to allow us to transform. It's both an energy that inspires and strengthens us and it's also a trigger for our own self-transformation. All right, so that's, uh, that's, what I, that's my, uh, my take on our lecture tonight. That was beautiful. Well, thanks, Kevin. Because you put a lot of effort into it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was so <laughs> thorough. But he was flowing, you know? He was flowing. It was well, effortless effort. You know, you think a lot about things and then you <laughs> kind of drop down. And... It. Oh my goodness. Actually, Alan, it's an interesting question. How much effort did you put into it? Since it's so pertinent to the lecture. <laughs> well, it's like a it's like a kind of I keep I keep attacking it, I keep reading it, I keep thinking about it. And it also helped that we scheduled this lecture for two weeks ago. <laughs> so it's kind of ready two weeks ago, and then we had to change it. And then I had my notes and I kept thinking about it and just kind of things pop into your, into my head. It's yeah. just sort of like, it's, it's a very interesting thing as, as a lot of things in life, right? The mediation between the ego and the higher self, like first one is doing its thing, then the higher self taking over, it's like a partnership. I, I guess I speak here of the positive ego. That is the ego that enables the higher self to come out because I took time to read the lecture, to study it. And the ego said, hey, Alan, you got to take your time now to do this. So, so the ego- So that every time it's the lecture is only two weeks from now. Right. To prepare yourself for then. Yes, then we, could, we could try that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friends. So um, Kevin, what, what kind of takes do we have on, on the lecture? And what do you you are so incredibly thorough. There's very little else to comment on, to be honest with you, Alan. But um, the last thing hit me first because uh, you ended with it. So it has to do with a paragraph, I think, on page, uh, what is it, page eight. Uh, one of the middle paragraphs, it comments, it uses the word trust like five or more times easily. And I think that's kind of key because in the end of all of this, that's what it's enabling. I mean, we use that word very flippantly in our culture, trust we very easily say, you haven't earned my trust. It has nothing to do with earning. That's all I can say from my experience alone. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what the guide and how the guide uses trusting, it's a very self full act. It's not an other full act. So when you say that, you know, I'm gonna be able to trust what occurs or trust in the nature of something, trust in the nature of the universe, trust in the nature of the other person, trust in the nature of myself. It's a selfful act. You know, it has right. everything to do with exactly what this thing goes through from page one all the way through. I don't know if he actually, if he uses trust anywhere else in this until he hits that paragraph. And then suddenly trust is all over the place. So, I mean, talk about earning your own trust. That's really what I think the guide always talks about is, and that, that well, be, be, without getting too strong, but one of the earlier points is about, I mean, on page two alone, and, and there's nothing on page two that specifically says this, but I, I think by page four, he talks about it very clearly, but by page two alone, when I was reading it, I wrote down my notes here, radical responsibility. 
Mm. Okay. That's all I wrote down at the bottom of the thing as I was reading it. I'm like, that's basically what the guide is saying. And what does that mean? Trust comes from self responsibility, right? I mean, if you can own, and I wrote afterwards, radical responsibility equals ownership of choice based on sight. That's it. <laughs> I mean, if you're not seeing, then check again. You know, if you can't trust in what you're seeing, check again what you're seeing. That's all that keeps coming back to the whole time. And it's about ownership of that sight, you know? And it's a choice. It's, it's like, it's funny. I was talking to my friend the other day and without going too much, too much into tangents, but at a work meeting that I was at for Christmas party, and we were just talking about what it means to, you know, like regret something in mm -hmm. one's life. And I said, mm -hmm. well, honestly, lately, I don't really look in terms of regret anymore. I just don't look back and see regret. And he's like, what do you mean? <laughs> he just looked at me. He's like, what do you mean? I don't understand that. I'm like, no, 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 seriously. Like, yeah. If yeah. you own your choices, yeah, you can look back and say, well, the self of me at that point never could have chosen otherwise. Right. So hence, I could never go back and judge my earlier self. Right. And he's like, well, someone else could have done it. I said, no, no, no. Someone else couldn't have done it. I said, you chose that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you own your choice yeah. based on sight, then that's radical responsibility. Yeah. And that's what I think the guide is basically. When I read it tonight, I was like, right. wow, right. Okay. synchronicity. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> like, shit. I completely agree it's crazy. About, about that. Anyway. Because whatever choices you made in the past were the choices made by your whole self, your right. entire yeah. self. Every part of yourself together made that choice. Right. And so in some sense, that choice was the right choice at the time. Well, right. Eckhart Tolle is always saying you, that you can to... only act according to your level of consciousness at any given point in time. Right. So you, you just can't go beyond it. So you, and then as your yeah. consciousness evolves, yeah. then you're yeah. acting. And then you learn. And another paradox, you know, the famous yeah. paradox of, of uh, well, urgency. No regretting it because you couldn't have done anything else. Right. Exactly. And right. This is also goes right into like, like a Buddhist kind of concept, which is like, you don't you have to accept what is what is what is in yourself and what is happening in your environment because ultimately if you're not accepting what is you're fighting against you're fighting against it and that's going to cause suffering anytime you're fighting against something you're, you're suffering so i had a unique experience about that for the first few years of the pandemic i was in a constant state of fighting against what was happening. I saw the suffering. I, I could see the consequences right from the beginning. I knew there was going to be untold amount of suffering, especially by the most vulnerable, which is, of course, what happened. And I, I was in a constant state of turmoil over it. And at some point, I realized this, this is, this is, this is just what is and all I'm doing by sort of thrashing against it emotionally is hurting myself I'm not helping anybody certainly not helping myself making myself very miserable by focusing constantly on you know sort of the fallout if you will to the most vulnerable to the most vulnerable so um maybe that's why I had to write the book get it out of me <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah. right does anyone uh, online want to, want to share something? Any thoughts out there? Hey, Steve. Uh, yeah, good evening. Um, pain and suffering, uh, interesting concepts. Um, I think the question was asked, why this suffering? How does it differ from pain? Um, I think pain is inevitable because of the system we're in, but suffering is not. And I think pain might be like, I have a toothache. That's pain, it's something I'm experiencing. Suffering is, oh my God, this is terrible. Why do I have a toothache? I really shouldn't have a toothache. I just spent thousands of dollars on my teeth. <laughs> so, <laughs> And, and then looking back upon my pain and suffering, I, 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 I've been very, very fortunate in, in that in my life, I've had very little pain, like toothaches and other problems like that. But I've had very little pain, but lots of suffering in fear that I would have pain. Mm -hmm. So I can clearly see the difference between pain and suffering. 
As far as uh, regrets go, I always allude back to the song that I think Frank Sinatra sang. Regrets, I have a few, but too few to mention. Yeah. Uh, and when we talk about regrets, what a, you know, if I have a regret, and I really don't have many, if any, actually regrets. I mean, there are things that I did in my life that I prefer I did not do, but I, I can't put it in the category of regret. Mm. Uh, because at that time that I did what I did, which may have caused pain to others as well as myself, that was the knowledge I had at that moment. And I could not have done anything different. But that's what I understood at that moment. In retrospect, it may not have been the best decision, but it was the best decision at that moment. And now I have new information. And hopefully I'm making decisions now that in the future, I will not look back and say, gee, I wish I made another decision, a different decision. You will. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that from Tracy, you by the that? way? You will? <laughs> yeah, right. I heard that. I will. And I, I will suffer as well. <laughs> Even though I understand the difference between pain and suffering, and I will suffer as well. So, uh, but hopefully it, it'll be diminished than, than on previous occasions. So I think those are very important points. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thoughts? Um, anyone in the room? Uh, Juan? Yeah, I can share a little bit. Thank yeah. you. I think Hello, everyone there. Um, OK, well, it's a great lecture, Alan and <laughs> Tracy. Thank you for selecting it again. You know, it's such a, it's so much in this lecture, the way I see it. There are so many points that as I was going through it, uh, so much came out. And uh, first, I, I, in the beginning, I concluded that well, by going through everything, I realized that, uh, as you're saying, uh, Alan, uh, suffering is unnecessary. That's what the guy says, right? And that sounds striking because uh, we all suffer, right? And here's someone who is coming from the realm of truth telling us that, yeah, well, what are you doing? You don't need to be suffering. There is, there is no suffering. There is no necessity for it. Um, but I, I, the way I understood it, uh, suffering is unnecessary because of all the limitation that we face. That's in create. Yeah, yeah that we create and we face. Yeah. yeah, in this, in this, uh, uh, you know, reality that we are living in, yeah. this limited reality yeah. we are, li we are <laughs> living. So, but once we transcend those limitations, in other words, the suffering is there because they leave the, the limitation that we have to, that we have brought upon ourselves. Right. Through the misconceptions that we have come about, you know, that we have concluded. So and, and those, of course, came, some of them from past reincarnations, right? Right, and those are, right, mm -hmm. those can be the ignorance coming from the past and the choices we made. Yeah, which is showed up in childhood, right? That's when they're mm -hmm. first- You know, misconceptions was a key word that you said, by the yeah. way. Yeah. It goes incredibly yeah. across the board. Yeah, 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 it does. It's all it about misunderstanding, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, yeah, so uh, so that, that point I got, and uh, another point that, um, that you also mentioned, Alan, is the, which I think is very, very important, anyway, personally to me, um, doing the very best rather than trying to give the best appearance. Yeah. You know, so we are so much, I think most of us, I mean, I myself am so guilty of that. So because we always try, to, it's very hard to be yourself. It's very hard, very difficult to be genuine. And it's just like, just be, just be me. I mean, all that will resolve if I just be me and just be natural and yeah, and accept myself as I am. Accept, you know, again, those limitations that I have, uh, you know, uh, impl implemented. Um, so, um, but that's, that, that's not, it's a lot easier to say than, than, of course. Well, you're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to, I, just I, to I, affirm I, that. For some reason, <laughs> I won't believe that. <laughs> um, uh, another word, another thing, uh, I mean, so many points here that it's, it's incredible. Um, let me see, uh, page, what was that one? Six. Um, another thing that I got from there was that, um, how we with apparently what I understood is that throughout beliefs, 
we bring about we bring about our reality. So what I believe is what is gonna I'm going to attract and it's gonna show in my life. So I, if I believe, like, like you said, you know, if I if I believe that I must uh, bleed, I will cut myself. I find a way to cut yeah. myself just yeah, to that. prove that I was right because yeah. again, the ego is involved. So yeah. by cutting myself, yeah. okay, there you go. I told you I was gonna bleed, but yeah, I am. I am bleeding. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those those images, which is the what you as you said, what bring about all the suffering is what um, you know, what um uh, what what we want to confirm just to basically prove our prove that we were right in our belief, right? If we don't want to admit again the involvement of the ego, we don't want to admit that we were wrong. That's so difficult, right? Yeah. To say, oh yeah, I, I was. Well, if we were wrong, we're going to be damned. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The either or situation. Yes, again, the either right? or situation because yeah. we think yeah. we, if the ego believes that if we are wrong, it's a matter of life or death. If I am wrong, that's it. I will be annihilated. Hey man, you've been yeah. wrong many times, and I still love you. And I was still. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing from page eight, and I think I, for page six, and I guess I will leave someone else uh, comment. Um, Another thing that struck me here was it's, it's a very, very important question, I think, that helps us to um, work with this either or uh, uh, business here, right? Uh, and, and this is a question that I try to ask myself often when I find myself in a situation that is confusing and it is very difficult to decide. And the guy very beautifully stated here, um, page six, uh, you know, um, the before one to the, the second one, two, three, four. Uh, in the fifth and the fourth paragraph here on the page six, where the guy says, the central question of all life issues is, is it constructive, productive, life affirming, and growth producing for all concerned? And that's it. If it gives me yes, the answer is yes, then yeah, okay. Easy to just move forward with the issue, right? So um Can you read that again. Well, this is the bottom of page, page six. six. Yeah, page six Which and uh, that's it's in the middle paragraph, the middle paragraph, paragraph one, four, two, three, four, and the fourth paragraph. This paragraphs. happens only because mm -hmm. you do not oh. question the issue in a spirit of really wanting to see whether or not it is constructive, productive, That's life great. affirming, That's and growth great. producing for all concerned. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that's, oh, yeah. that's that's very helpful, right? Yeah, I think that when you was like, okay. Um, yeah. So, um, and the issue of, of course, of self responsibility, that's another one that I. That, uh, that on the line that struck me is I am a free creature with self responsibility. <clears throat> That's something. It's now that I am a free, yes, I'm going to go around and just do what I want and do whatever we're I want. We're so to do. worried about other people's yeah. self responsibility. <laughs> so it's amazing how much we're interested in other people's self responsibility, but we fail to see our own. Yes. Right? right. Or at least call to task our own at first. Yeah. So. Yeah. But once you assume yes. that position of taking yeah. you know, yeah. responsibility, <laughs> Then yeah. everything else seems to fall into place. Yeah, you know it's so what I mean. The guy that wanted earlier, okay. the guy that actually yeah. says unequivocally that enlightenment is impossible without full self responsibility. Right, yes. You have to it have is. that. It's an absolute prerequisite. I believe that so much. It Absolutely, is, yeah. our experience is yeah. to be through it. Yes. All right. Any other comments uh, from the room, the room here, so Moshe? I have a question first. Yeah, go ahead. We talked about effort. Uh, yes, so I'm trying to understand if I understand correctly or not. Is uh, when it was talking about is is there is a point that it is become effortless? Yes, yeah, joyful effort is what you. Would so, say. so let me give you an example. Page five. So imagine so you're a therapist, right? Yeah. So Moises, says you're a therapist, right? Now let's say you're you're you uh, have a client and you, you've been working with them for quite some time. So there's a lot of trust. You have a lot of knowledge about this person. And so you're just, you're just connected. You're just in the flow and, and you just speak from your heart to this patient. And then afterwards you say to yourself, wow, that was a beautiful, a beautiful insight that I had in that moment. You know, that, that I think that that was really a very, um, uh, almost like a gift to this person in the process, right? But it wasn't effortful. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You weren't thinking about it ahead of time. Oh, how can I formulate what's the best thing that I can do with this mm -hmm. issue that's being presented to me? It just, it just comes out from all your experience and your knowledge. You I, think yeah, I think and that's, yeah, I think that's effort. 
Let's you just get into the jump zone. in. Yeah. Once you hit that inflection point where you entered the zone, yeah. and the, you know, I really experienced that for the first time very strongly physically because when I was when I was a child, I was on the U.S. national swim team. So they pushed us to, you know, yeah. a breaking point. Swimming is a big one. To, you yeah. know, to, to, to get better. Okay. And so at some point, you know, you're at the beginning, you're, you're just in pain. You, 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 you know, however many times you have to go up and down the pool and at a certain rate and, you know, your eyes and back then we didn't have goggles, my, you know, your eyes are burning. And then at some point you sort of break through, you feel it, you feel it and you enter this what I would call the zone, but you almost float. Then you 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 float. You're you're just dis disengaged from your paint from your body at that point, and you're going through the water extremely fast, but but almost in in a bubble of where you where it's, you're not really. And the other that was the first time I I, I, I the other thing when I used to when I was working I would often fly back from Europe on the Concorde. And when you go through the speed of sound, the, right as you're hitting it, the plane just, there, it's like a resistance is so strong. You can feel, you can just feel it. And then you, you go through the speed of sound and then it's almost like you, you've transcended like, like the spaceships that get away from the gravity and then you're floating. And, and so, and then there's like, it's no, you, you're just, there's no sound in the plane. There's no, there's no, rattle it i mean you're just there's yeah. just you're just floating once yeah. you break through the speed of sound so i think those physical representations are just examples of they are they are what and exactly what, what, what yeah I, I just wanted and I, and I thought that this is uh what what, what this lecture talked about but i wanted to talk about this aspect of uh, uh, you know we have kind of like this kind of an ideal no um what you know i'm just reading that book right now it's called the tools i don't know anyway it talks about we have this ideal notion that there is we wish one day as a spiritual human being there is what it's called exoneration that we're going to get into this ideal sp space that we're going to make everything effortless but you know he's kind of like saying the the, the reverse in some ways momentarily yes we can experience that with but we have to accept that we have to work for the rest of our life nonstop as a as human being that have duality nonstop. We need to aspire to that point, but we, let's don't be, again, let's see reality. We should not be delusional mm -hmm. in, the, in that aspect. That's reality. So in similar, we have to experience pain. Again, suffering is optional. We have to accept life. We have to accept that no matter what we do, we are going to continue making that effort. And again, it's about the journey that you know we are going to do that. And that's important to at least to be realistic about that. That's that's mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think uh, <coughs> sure, Cass. For a second. So uh, I think you made up a brief, really important point here, Moisha, and that's that it it's the identification of the self. Remember back to the ego question earlier on. <clears throat> so if one sees oneself and gives credence to the ego itself as a limited identity within the ocean of experience, then effort by its very nature and term alone will be equal to some cost, yeah. okay? But if you look at effort, like take away all the definitions of the word right mm -hmm. now, in an instant, take away the definitions, just cut it and look at what the words joyful effort say to you. It just means joyful doing. That's all it is. It's not cost. It's joyful doing. Stop being stagnant. It's joyful doing. And that's all I repeat to myself when I go through it. Because I also experience the same cost of the effort. Okay? Because I identify with the ego. We all do. Right? We all identify with limitation within the infinite ocean. And the fact that we're going to lose something in the limitation. But as soon as you see, and that's what the instantaneous sight is. It's not that the instantaneous sight always stays. It's that the instantaneous sight is possible. In an instant, you can see for a moment very clearly that the limited is not what you are. Then you can see the joyful doing. And it's joyful, uh, joyful effort along with what uh, he said that basically it's toward living. It's toward living. Toward, toward basically right. 
and creating this unity that's beneficial. Yeah, there's an amazing thing in this lecture, by the way, that talks about the fact that those who live and are active are not afraid of dying. Yeah. And I don't know where it is yeah. in here, but that is phenomenal when I read that. I have no way to unpack that yet, to be honest with you. I, it's so beyond me when I heard that. But I sat there and just looked at that and went, well, I think I need to dig into that later. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> but, but there's a portion in there that says if you're stagnant, then you're afraid of death, basically. Yeah. Because you don't want to move. Right, right. Yeah. Because you wish. You have to grow. You I'm have like, to grow. Ah. Yeah, you equal movement with dying, basically. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, the more you practice the path of self-facing, the more you are able to get right. into that effortless space. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, the more you're able, kind of like working out, it's I mean, it's a like good parallel, right? The more you exercise, the more limber you yeah. are, yeah. the more, you know, you don't, you well, know, you're not phased by a hill or a mountain that you have to climb <clears> or, <throat> or steps or things like that. The more you school yourself in this process, the more you feel the effortlessness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, Barbara. I, well, I wanted to share, um, you know, just, um, you know, especially now, right now, you're talking about um, uh, fear of death and effort. And right now, Bill is, um, um, you know, on, uh, you know, on that path of um, near end of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had a, um, like, you know, medical, catastrophic medical um, uh, event in October. And um, after being in the hospital for a, 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 a um, week, he lost the ability to walk and um, is really completely debilitated. So he's now um, at a rehab center facility uh, right by my house. So I'm there every day visiting him, but his effort, it, it's, he, it's a lung and heart condition and he doesn't have endurance to, to do very much. And it's, um, it's very painful for me. I mean, the whole thing is painful, but especially um, that part that um, he's, that, that his um, ability to um, move or, or, or give effort is um, so, so limited. So I just, I wasn't going to share particularly about that part. I, what, more I wanted to talk about was my feeling of, um, you know, like in the beginning of the lecture, talking about um, uh, sort of limitations and how free we are. And I think I've talked before about how I'm a lot of who I am as being a caretaker and caring. And here's another situation where I'm there for my husband. And I mean, it's really meaningful and where I want to be. And there's so many, um, you know, meaningful moments after 46 years of even as he's fading um, to be able to sort of share uh, different things, even like, um, you know, sometimes he's, he's able to turn in, in his hospital bed and we'll, we'll talk through the railing and, um, you know, and it just feels very close and intimate. Um, and so that idea of, um, you know, going, I mean, through this period, and as, as I told Bill, despite yourself, I think you may last quite a while, you know, um, I don't know how long he'll be in this state. And that's, that's one of the things for me is sort of feeling like, well, there was a crisis. I was there like, as you know, like, as you know, every, not every hour, but, you know, practically, you know, um, nine, you know, eight to nine every day. And now that he's at this rehab facility near the house, I'm there eight in the morning. And um, I, I've now figured out where I, I take a break in the afternoon, but basically I'm there from eight to eight with like a three hour break in the middle of the day. And um, I, 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 um, I feel like, well, I, I want some more, um, you know, that I'm not always happy doing that and trying to figure out how I can have more time away. And so that's how I related to the lecture in terms of 
the freedom and you know like one one gesture and you can you know oh. <laughs> you can just do something else or be free and um it's not for me it's not that one gesture it's a slow process what i've been able to do is get um other people that i trust to come and be with bill and then i'll feel comfortable like tonight he has a good friend who um had you know came and relieved me for dinner so i um was able to come here and um anyway that's i just wanted to share that and how um you know that in my life journey, this lecture um, made, you know, that particular part about, you know, breaking free, but um, all the other aspects of it um, in terms of self-responsibility, um, I found very, um, you know, very, very meaningful. And even sort of like that sphere of influence, I, um, you know, I have, lots of relationships with all different people at, at the rehab center now like all the different aides and nurses and i feel like i'm sort of like part you know like part of the team and getting into different discussions with different people there and it sort of feels like um uh that i have a certain kind of influence in terms of um displaying care and devotion mm. and and love he's a lucky man yeah he's a lucky man very yeah. much one of the aides told him that and he said it's mutual <laughs> <laughs> he's a doting parallel mm -hmm. so Take care, okay, Barbara, of yourself through the journey as a caregiver. And I understand, or at least from what I understand, it takes time and there's momentum in the process. I've been with my parents both as they've gone through, let's just say, conditions that I felt were very difficult to deal with through their last days. And it's very hard to be forgiving of yourself. At least that's what I experienced. Mm. Very hard because sometimes imperfections exist in the process. And it's easy to call yourself to task for that because the capacity seems larger here than there, right? But be kind to yourself, Barbara, throughout this, please. And I send you, I send you my love. Thank you. Really Thank you. deeply. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I feel very grateful to be here and you know, part of this group, and well, thank you. Thanks. I remember Bill well, mm -hmm. you know, from the days in the Patrick Center. Mm -hmm. Please, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'll send him my love also. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Mary? Yeah. Yes, even though we are discussing the lecture, your sharing uh, has touched me too very deeply, Barbara. And since I know you and Bill, um, I, that that light, and I feel that with all of us, and then especially your sharing, Barbara, of how it is a mutuality, of course, <laughs> doesn't feel like it all the time, but the light that the two of you together emanate is so lasting and eternal, and it has touched me so very deeply, knowing you, and I thought nothing can ever stop that. So I thank you for sharing what you shared tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? What are we so stuck? Bill. Here's William. You William. Know? You got, you're breaking, breaking up. up. Hold on, you what I'm struck by that, I, and I looked it up. This lecture is 1964, and then it starts me by giving your best, just giving your best, and ask. that's what, like one of the things that you have to do, and ask for guidance for that. And then I, I'm, I'm, I'm always struck by the quote from a lecture. It's, well, in, the, in Holland, it's 30, 238A. And it's, it's a it's a small quote about a, that 
talks about giving your best, and that's why I deserve my best, deserve the best. Yes, I think that's, that's good. Yes, a prayer that uh, I serve the best cause in life, I deserve the best from life. Yeah, and that is from, I think, 1974. And to me, that's really, like, it's, it's really one of the strong things that I always go back to, that it's like a, that kind of prayer. And yes. uh, now it's coming, and then I, I just see, oh, the guys are already talking about the night. Oh, wow, and I thought he was only doing it in the end, uh, like in 1974 or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. So, so, William, we, we can, really can't hear you very well. <clears throat> You're breaking up a lot <clears throat> for some reason. Okay. Maybe it's the internet connection. Yeah, okay, no problem. <laughs> okay, but thank you. Any other thoughts? Uh, Teresa, you were there, but you know, maybe she'll come back. Uh, Kathleen, would you like to, uh, anything to say? Any thoughts? It's good to see you, Kathleen, even though I can't see you. Uh, it's good that you're here. <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> I look, I just, uh, I just got up from the bed. I was like laying down, just enjoying listening to everybody and relaxing. It's so good to see everybody. Hi. Hi, um, Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello, everybody. Great to see you there. Yeah, yeah same here. Um, just, just a fabulous lecture and, um, Gosh, so much, um, well, a lot, but I guess, I guess what really calls to me this, um, this piece about how so much is available to us and that if we put aside worrying about what other people say and we really bring forth our efforts just focus on what it is that we want and put all our energy and action behind that, that it comes to us. If that's simple, that's the formula. And um, so I'm working through some things about uh, not spending so much time uh, looking for approval from others or uh, worrying about what others might think about what I say, and so so that's been really really helpful. Um, and the tr trust thing, Kevin, what you were talking about, boy, does that really jump out? About yeah. the guy talks about it in another lecture that um, the divine current in, in fear is faith. And when we're fearful, the guy says, well, there must be a faith issue, you know? And so, um, so trust also requires faith, right? Having faith in, in what the higher self communicates to us. So just a, just a fabulous lecture, yeah. Yeah, that, that what you mentioned about the, neg the positive aspects of negative things, that's such a key in the path work, you know, that every negative manifestation has a positive core. And I, I was thinking of actually taking a lot of time and trying to analyze every negative and manifestation I can think of and seeing what the positive core of it is. Because somehow if you identify the positive core, it kind of explodes the negative. Yeah. The negative kind of fades away and you're not held into the, the negative anymore. I think that's very possible yeah. once you've really approached and confronted and listened to in love the lower self. I have used to do what you just said prior to that process and it can be a mess because you can be very <laughs> divided in the process and you could be exploding on yourself, okay? But once yeah. you've confronted the lower self to at least like remember what Tracy and I have talked about in the past, and you get to a place where you're like, finally, I think I got somewhat of a handle on having a dialogue with this monster. <laughs> then yes, then what you just said is exactly, I think, really yeah, how the experience yeah. well, lies. 
done some really amazing dialogues with his lower self, which he shared with me. And it's, it's really something. Yeah. Yeah. But, you, you know, I, I like that connection because you're helping me realize that um, in the illusion or the limitation of worrying about, you know, what others might be thinking or looking for that approval, um, which is very childlike looking for, you know, it's really like the childhood trappings of, of me seeking that from my mother. Um, at the very core of that, what the, the divine current of that is just express myself, just, you know, take action, do what I really enjoy or, or desire to do. And that is the divine kernel of it. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Do you remember, do you remember Kathleen that uh, the Christmas lecture or lecture to the children, there's a whole thing that goes through, I think it's 204 or something like that. It's right around there, but it goes through the exact thing of like, well, if this is what you're experiencing on the negative, what's the positive current of that? And oh my goodness, that lecture is so re relatory yeah, when yeah. you're ready for it, because it explodes. Like as you read it, you go, oh yeah, that's me. Oh yeah, that's me. Oh, that, oh yeah. I guess that could be the positive side of it. And you just kind of like, go like, whoa, like, oh my goodness. So, I mean, it's, it, yeah. I think it's really helpful to see examples of that. That's all I'm saying, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Yeah, yeah, great to see you, Kathleen. Uh, Ellen, did you want to say something, uh, Susan? Uh, you don't have to. Uh, go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I just want to say um, what you were just saying, Alan, about um, something <clears throat> positive coming from something negative. I um, that hit me on page six with that that whole thing that uh, one brought up earlier, um, wanting to see whether not wanting to see whether something's constructive, productive, life-affirming and growth producing for all concerned. It hit me when I was reading this, I have um, coming day nine of COVID <clears throat> right now. Um, this is the first time I've had COVID and, um, <clears throat> and I'm still testing positive and, um, So I'm, you know, very feeling very frustrated about quarantining. It's difficult with the kittens, and um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, there's there's a lot about it that's frustrating. And when I looked at, at this, I could really understand um, a lot of why. Because like, I <clears throat> have no idea where I got COVID from and um, I'm the only one in this house who has it. You know, it's wonderful. I haven't given it to anybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it really makes me look at, well, clearly there's a lesson in this for, for me personally, <laughs> um, <clears throat> that, that I have it. And I'm really understanding why that is. And it feels far less frustrating when I look at it that way. You know, I look at all the ways that I was um, struggling be just before this with my codependency and um, and not taking care of myself, but putting everybody else's needs primary. And this is forcing me to make myself primary, give myself the care that I need. And, and I'm getting wonderful care also from my husband, from like all the parents of the, the students that I can't work with. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, and my mom is doing fantastic. 
on, you know, she's in assisted living, but um, like all the places where I thought like people can't manage without me, they won't survive. Everybody's doing great. <laughs> you know? And I really needed to see that. So it's really, I'm, I'm very grateful that, you know, COVID's not even over for me yet, but I got the message. <laughs> this lecture really helped me with that. Great. It's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, thank yeah. you for sharing. Take down those fences. <clears throat> Ellen, did you want to say something? You don't have to. Yeah, I, th I think tonight I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Nice to see you guys. Oh, Joel. Ellen, I did have one. Question. Joel had a question. Yes. Oh. So, my page is a little different. It's probably your page two or three. So you touched on it a little bit, and I, I mean, I'm still having a little bit of a tough time with this. So we're talking about the walls in the maze, right? So yes. the first yes. wall in the maze is our belief that we cannot have what we so easily might have. That that I'm I've, I've got that one. Second wall resulting from the first is your shame about a non-existent and not unnecessary deprivation. Could you speak to that or anyone? I don't understand what that, I really don't quite understand that. So I'm ashamed of the fact that I'm not getting what I can if I believe that I could. Um, we just speak to that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's think about this. The second wall resulting from the first is your shame about a non-existent and unnecessary deprivation. So in other words, you believe that you can't have what you so easily might have. So in other words, let's say that I could get a promotion and be the head of my department if I simply put out more effort and was more gregarious or I, 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 I exercised, I worked hard at my job, I could have that. Um, but I don't believe I could. I don't believe I can have it. So I feel ashamed and I feel badly that I'm not what I could have, I, I don't have what I, what I could have. Because there's an aspect of you that knows that that's a lie. That's right. what I think that's talking yeah. about. Yeah. Because you're fooling yourself in that and thus there's shame in lying to yourself. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's regarding any goal. I, 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 that you could have, that you believe you, it's the belief you that believe you, you can't can have, have it. You not have, but you can have if you just put in the effort and kind of like go for it. You know, it's the sitting in the corner the syndrome as a child. You know, when you go sit in the corner and you're like, I'm punished and now I'm not good to do anything. And you, oh, so I'm just going to live up to that punishment forever. Like, yeah, mom doesn't trust me. So therefore I'm not going to trust me. I'm nothing. Right. Yeah, and the, so it's that rebellious, like, but it comes with a shame. That's the problem with it. You and do the that. third thing is, is, is a similar, it goes along with the other two. The third twisted corridor in the labyrinth of the mind is the pretense that you have what you want or could have if you wanted to while you believe the opposite. Right. Yeah. right. And this pretense thing. You really, right. <laughs> it's another yeah. pretend on top of yeah. that. It's like pretend upon pretend. Yeah, I can, now I in the world of form. Instead of we're, the world uh, of symbolism, yeah, I just don't mind. You know, if I wanted, I could, you know, we're, yeah, I could have gotten, we're you know. convoluted creatures. It's, it's oh, false tell me about it. It's false good. And it's, it's a lie. It's one. But I think the one thing I always, when I read this uh, repeatedly, Joel, I whenever I hear questions about it, I almost want to steer people away from the maze because even though the maze appears real, and even though we got questions about the areas of the maze that we don't understand, it's still not real. That's what I keep wanting to go back to and slap people. I mean, I feel like the old Zen master that wants to whack the back of the head with the stick sometimes because i'm like <laughs> stop it i'm like stop getting lost in the maze like you know sometimes that's exactly what you need is to wake up and say it can be done in an instant and it's like you see it's like i think what happens with the zen teachers is that they they learn what's appropriate for a given moment in the student's movement and path sometimes they need to sit and work through their maze and sometimes they need the whack on the back of the head and to say, stop it. 
stop getting lost in the maze. It could all be done in an instant. And it's the balance of those two things that I think gets yeah. you through is to keep working on those. <clears throat> yeah, now I wanted to uh, spend a little time on a couple of other things. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, did you want to say anything, J Mr. Henderson, uh, Jordan? Uh, it's up to you. Uh, from from Pittsburgh. I I um uh, I want to tell thank everybody for I want to thank you, Alan, for the wonderful lecture this evening. And I have I am ever so grateful that I could join and listen tonight. Um. I had a thought when we were earlier talking about regrets and suffering, and I was wondering if a regret is suffering. It's because wonderful. the, the it involves suffering. Yes, yeah. I think so. Yeah, you indeed. That you're suffering. Every, I mean, any acceptance, uh, this unacceptance of reality. It's it's suffering. Suffering. Really suffering. So yes. regret is is is, is it's so look at the yeah. reality that already it, happened yeah. in the past. And, and then you create it. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's another layer. Yeah. Of, yeah. Of, yeah. Look on regret as the opposite of acceptance yeah. and suffer. I mean, sorry. Look on suffering as the opposite of acceptance, acceptance. and regret is one form of that lack of acceptance. Okay. Yes. Makes sense? Yes. Because honestly, there's a plenty a lot of that lack of acceptance, but regret is a big one for sure, <laughs> without a doubt. That's clear then, resentment is another biggie <laughs> right there off the top of my head. But yeah, there's tons, yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you though for sharing, that was awesome. Miriam, did you wanna say something? Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to share something, I'll try to, make it short, we're right about the end, because this lecture has so much in it, I thank you, so much richness, so I can't comment on the whole lecture. But what I wanted to share something, because I'm not a teacher here, I'm a sharer, and that is this paragraph toward the very end that says, you cannot step out of the fence unless you discover that you are a free creature <laughs> with self-responsibility. And one thing that never leaves me, even when I am suffering because when I know I'm suffering it's when I'm totally identified as a human being with no spirit that is total suffering being a human being and so that's when there's a clue oh I haven't shifted into my power my higher self but something that I know because it's very individual for me is that I am a free creature and so even if I'm not experiencing in the moment, I know it. And my higher self lets me know it by a little ping in my right temple if I'm if I'm like in any way transgressing that. So that brings me to something I just wanted to share because it's a delight in my life. And that is I just need my reminder. Oh, and so I have what is called a toolbox. I have my day daily to do this. But at the top, I have crossed my toolbox. And there's an exercise I do every day to get my um, uh, nitric acid flowing through all my body. So that's dealing with my energy and my, my physical body. And then I have my meditation. I have a mirror exercise where I look in the mirror and I have certain things I say. So a strung across the top is my toolbox of everything that is no effort. And when I don't do one of them someday, I don't feel guilty. Uh, it's like, oh, start over to next day if I haven't done my, my <clears throat> exercise or my heart uh, on my hand. That's my Matt Kahn exercise. And then, so my metaphor is that if I'm building a house and I only have a hammer and a nail, I'm not going to get very far with that toolbox of building the house. Uh, so I'm going to need a, you know, but if I have trying to use a power saw for where I only do need a hammer or nail. So it's like picking and choosing. I am just so grateful that I have all these tools across the top that I can pull from to helps me shift back into uh, if I'm not experiencing exactly the unitive state, I'm being reminded by being what the guide says, you know, there's self or other then self and other and then I am. So if I'm in, in the self or other, at least with my toolbox, I can get into the self and other, and that's the gateway for being my free self, which I know I am, and my higher self will always remind me. So I just wanted to share that because it's the delight in my life because I, I had three near-death experiences last year. So I am in trauma recovery. This is no 
no quick fix. There's no quick fix. I'm so grateful that what that I have the tools to align with what the guides concepts and the truth. So I just wanted to say that. And so as a sharing, because I have all these many, many tools to build my mansion with. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as some of you guys know, I was able to broker the uh, obtaining of a big archive of Eva's materials uh, from uh, Eva's uh, stepmother, I mean, sorry, Eva's stepdaughter, Magdalene Paracas, John Paracas' daughter. And uh, these were all kinds of personal effects and, and writings that Eva had and photographs that um, had been stored in a warehouse by Magdalene until recently when a path worker in Seattle made an arrangement through me to purchase these materials on behalf of the foundation. And um, one, of the, one of the objects items in this collection was a, this book um, that Eva had written. Well, it's a notebook and it's called Excerpts of Some Basic Tenets of the Guide's Teachings, Fundamental Psychic Laws. So there are 12 of these uh, fundamental psychic laws as, as Eva calls them. And I don't think anyone has seen this for 50 years, probably at least. <laughs> cool. uh, and I wanted to read one of them. And uh, you know that there is a lecture, additional material where spiritual laws are put forward that were formulated by a training class, Pathwork. Yeah, I, I think I have it. And yeah. this, however, is a lot more sophisticated than that. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And I wanted to read one of them, uh, one of the ones that Eva has written. This is a historical moment. This is yeah. a moment, That's right. No one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a yeah, we here history. Now, yeah. All right, here goes Eva. It, it, this is her own uh, type, type written here uh, on, her, on her manual typewriter. Personal responsibility for recreating negative soul substance. All misconceptions, destructive patterns, negative wishes, denials of self, vicious circles, etc., create or express negative energy patterns in the soul substance. The concise awareness and understanding of these is, of course, imperative. This requires a constant vigilance and the repeated formation of determination to honesty and courage. This, in turn, activates the divine self and recognition becomes increasingly easy and liberating. Just as this first aspect is a result of personal interaction, so is the second aspect, the recreation and re-impression of soul substance. Here too, the self must deliberately activate the divine, requesting help from within to make new reactions possible, to give a new sense and experience how it feels when the soul substance is healthy and in truth. Thus, from an intellectual understanding, a new inner emotional reaction gradually develops. The, interact, the intellect and outer will cannot do this, but they must call the divine into action, which inevitably does so effortlessly as it always operates. The responsibility of the conscious mind also exists in actively impressing the soul substance with the truth, as opposed to the hitherto false belief. This must be done by clearly thinking out the truthful concept, the benign circle. These thoughts must be firm, relaxed, determined, full of vital energy. This will alter the involuntary processes. Yeah. This will alter the what? Part? Involuntary. involuntary so she wrote that, I don't know when, could be the late 60s, maybe, or mid 60s. But I'm going to make a, a, a scan of these and I'll send them to you guys. What number was that? Was this there a specific is, number of it? This is the- uh, <laughs> That you read from, I'm just curious. No, there are 12 of these There's and this 12. is one of them. Okay, just one of them. Okay. Yeah, so I just was really struck by how many tie-ins there are off the lecture that we've well, talked yeah. about today, about effort, about, activating the divine you know um about Responsive responsibility impressing yeah, imp right, and act the active emphasis right yeah. on, on you know 
impressing the positive into your soul substance. You could see that in the automatic writing. What she was yeah. struggling with was oh, exactly yeah. let's, that. Let's, let's read the automatic writing That's also. exactly what she was um, yeah, or going through, actually. That was I, uh, very fascinating, though. So. The automatic the writing, writings. which was put together, uh, Kevin did a beautiful translation of yeah, saying. Kevin, I had a lot of trouble understanding a lot, some of these uh, words. That's what I was like. What does she mean here? I mean, well, a lot of it I understood. But a few words, I was like, well, oh. what, it's Eva kind of is asking for guidance. You did a great job. Kevin. It's a channeling, okay. and I yeah. will. Yeah, you did a great job. You just sit down and start writing. It says spirit is really. Yeah. Like, Mouth, like Mouthly was the funniest one out of them all, actually. <laughs> yeah. Mouthly, meaning, yeah. meaning stop talking, start writing, yeah, because yeah. you can stop thinking when you're writing and listening okay, to can me. Can everybody yeah. see That's this? That aspect I find fascinating. How well, he for her. insisted of for her. moving away yeah. you, you from just speaking. thinking yeah. and just allow this. Well, she was probably a really good speaker, is my oh, guess no. from what I read. Yeah, <laughs> she she was a great speaker, but she believed her own bullshit. So basically, she had to kind of calm into it and yeah. start writing and listening yeah. and then it's not being yeah. mouthy basically is yeah, what yeah, surrender and allow that guidance yeah, i was like shocking when i read that i'm like oh wow it sounds like me <laughs> 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 yeah. so uh let's see i'm uh able to share are you sure yeah i think i'm sure can you guys see the uh the writing <gasps> yeah yes see it all right, I'm going to try to, yes. I can, yes. uh, I'm going to see if I can uh, zoom out a little bit. Um, okay, let's see. Here we go. Now, you know, um, Kevin, as I said, and Rita um, and uh, Hava did a beautiful job of, uh, of going over this and now, most of what we can read it, and um, I'm just struck by the kind of openness of the writing. I, I, I'm not the, not the words, but the way the, written, the letters are formed. If you can see it, it's sort of like, it's very expansive. Yeah. And, and it's, it's on a big sheet of paper. So this looks like, you know, when you try to write guidance, I think you, you kind of write something in an expansive script. In other words, it's not a little script, it's a big expansive script. So, so he says, <clears throat> um, do you want to read your- uh, I'm going to read my transcript Kevin, you, if it's you okay. Read your transcript. Go right ahead. All right, I wrote it out separately here, but you can scroll through it and see if yeah. you can follow through it. Okay, right, go right. Ahead. It is good that way. And who knows what the question was prior that right. obviously the guide or the, the, the feedback is responding to. I don't want to call it the guide because again, there's many different sources of necessarily channeled information that's yeah. coming through on these early transcripts. And that's really important to notice, okay? Um, God is with you all the time. You are not alone. Never are you alone, never. The way is often stony. It must be, it cannot be avoided. Please try to have faith. I am not your guide but I am also allowed to help. And I pause there just for a moment because I think it's important to recognize that the whole idea of the pathwork guide was not formulated yet in Ava's mind. It's clear, this is so early. Yeah. So it's not talking about the guide as in the pathwork guide. I really believe when I read that, that it's about the fact that Ava was looking towards her higher self or her own guide, internal guide, like we all do, right? And saying, look, you're actually channeling something other than your higher self here for the first time. I am not your higher self, but I am also allowed to help. And I've gone through that process, which is actually reaching out into, let's say, the non-identity. And I think it's really important to recognize that that's kind of an area where you're like, ah, I don't know what I'm tapping into, right? How do I justify what this is? I'm not really sure. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it otherworldly? Whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not the pathwork guide, but it's, again, tapping into something outside of herself and it's her maybe one of her first times so but it's a sh reassuring her i'm also allowed to help you ask me questions so the question the first one was why am i in such agony now and it sounds like she went through some kind of now, difficulty and that's eva's own writing you see it's different right than the guided writing <laughs> yeah, oh, oh. yeah that's really important to notice too. <laughs> exactly she changed her entire style in that moment when she wrote her question. Where's the question? Oh, yeah. right there. Okay. Yeah. 
Why yeah. am I in such agony now? And, and so again, the voice responds to her, you are in agony because you do not understand all that is happening. You cannot see the configuration. It cannot ever be ever explained. You mm -hmm. must learn to feel into it wow, on the intuitive level. So, right so pause for a second. You'll see throughout this whole writing that she was incredibly intellectual. That's yeah, what it yeah, seems yeah. like. Like she was so yeah. brainy up front. Yeah. Okay. So it's saying, look, stop being so brainy. It's kind of what he's, yeah. you know, the, whatever the oh, voice is saying. Yeah, yeah. It will come to you from within. Yeah. There is no way to avoid this inner learning. You want to solve it with outer understanding, and that is not possible. Please ask for inner understanding, and it will come to you. Beautiful. Then it goes to a new paragraph right here. She indents. Mm -hmm. She says, make yourself empty inwardly so that it can be given you. And that's kind of really key to this whole thing, is the fact that stop thinking or stop yeah. trying to formulate it yourself. Stop using your ego. Put aside your ego. And Put aside your yeah, ego yeah, and stop matter. trying to come up with the sentence or yeah. the answer or whatever it is. That's right. And so yeah, it continues, um, your mind is too busy thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it gets really clear here mm -hmm. with what it already knows. Mm -hmm. So how then can it be filled with new knowledge? And I think there's a question mark and an exclamation point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was shocked when I saw that. I'm like, wow, it's really being emphatic here, you know? So it's really saying, hey, wake up. It's like the stick on the back of the neck again, like I mentioned a little bit. Stop making your mind work so hard. Learn the new art that is now waiting for you to empty your mind. It is the next phase anyway, regardless of this slightly unpleasant experience that she must have went through recently. For this is really all that it is, my dear child. This is why you were led to take the pen again mm -hmm. after all these years. It is a good way to empty your mind. Practice calming and quieting and emptying your mind. You know the technique. It is what you now need so badly. And it's amazing because when... <laughs> It's so funny going through that because doing a lot of written work myself, it's like sometimes you say to yourself, oh God, I need that so badly, but I don't do it. And yet you come back to it and then you hear the voice and the voice is coming from somewhere else and you're like, yeah, you need that so badly. Mm -hmm. And it's screaming to you in this exact same way. So it's, it's very, very clear to me. Um, never could you learn this, right? Or other new spiritual acquisitions when all goes mouthly. So she's basically, he's basically saying to her, you tend to live your life thinking and speaking quickly. You mm -hmm. don't, you know, you don't necessarily want to take the time to People just keep. be silent, yeah. right? And maybe in her case, it was easier to be silent when she was writing at that point, right? And again, maybe that's just a brief snippet of where she was at at that moment. Um, only, then it says, only when what you now know and are is no longer sufficient meaning when you don't have your answers, right. right? Will you allow this to happen or it to happen? Yeah. Isn't that right? It says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you will <laughs> then grow increasingly in faith, conviction and experience how real, how immediate the reality of spirit life are. Uh -huh. okay, and then, then she says, she questions, who are you? <laughs> Which I thought was amazing here. She wrote, yeah. right? Yeah. Who are you? Like, like what's going, what's happening here? Yeah. And the response was, I am a being who is often around you, together with many others, in order to help and learn myself. Wow. Okay, which was amazing when I read that. I'm like, nice, yeah. nice. It's really a, a communal activity, yeah. even for the spirit even world. The spirit, to her. So she's like, well, it's not just for me to distribute or anything, or even just for me. It's the link in the chain, like the guide was talking on lecture two or whatever. I think it was yeah. two. But yeah so it's also the this voice that's talking to her is learning mm -hmm. so make my name does not matter make your mind empty and keep free for the fruits of the christ in you mm -hmm. your outer mind must recede in its present predominance it clutters up the beautiful ever-present reality of spirit only then can connections be seen and thus the peace and love of God gleam. <clears throat> there is in everything that comes to pass a sweet, deep meaning. And that's exactly what we were saying tonight, right? Even in the difficulties yes. that we are 
saying the negatives exist, yes. but there's a sweet, deep meaning. You will discover it soon now in its wonderful, awesome wisdom. Now, this is really interesting. There's some ad, ad, admonition or whatever they call, you know, like kind of like, hey, <laughs> wake up here. But next comes, you are, it's, it, it says, you are now cut off from the inner fruits of being in spite of your sincerity of purpose. So this is really interesting because the first time I've ever noticed that good intentions as what it says here was not exactly equal to putting those in intentions mm -hmm. into causal action, mm -hmm. okay? So if you look at many, many different systems talk about intentionality, then causality, then symbology, and then physicality. And if you go down that into that, most people live at level of physicality. If it happens to them, that's all that matters. Yeah, if it yeah. doesn't happen to them, that's all that matters. But she has good intentions. But now, how do I make that causal? Yeah, is that what was, he's basically ca yeah. calling out here. Okay. So you're, even though you're sincere of purpose, is what it says, because you are too involved with the already developed mind equipment, meaning you think you know the answers. You're not listening to the true causal, the causality. Language. Yeah. Every difficult situation. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, because you were too involved with the already developed mind equipment. Every difficult situation requires you to extend your faculties into as yet undeveloped areas. And it's interesting in this, by the way, there's something here about unused faculties. In page three of this lecture, that's what freaked me out actually as we were talking about it, was like, it says unused faculties. It comes right straight back to here, like a synchronicity here. Because again, we all have a lot of unused faculties. In her case, maybe it was other than her mind. And some people, it might be their mind that needs to be used more in order to formulate all of the feelings that they have, right? Or the sensations that they have, depending upon, like as, as Miriam said, you know, many times, right? The will, the, the, the thought, or the, the emotional types. But certainly for her, it seems like she was in integrated very strongly into the, the thought type. So her unused faculty here was like, listen, stop, stop yeah. thinking, listen. So anyway, her faculty, um, where am I here? Okay, um, right. Every difficult situation requires you to extend your faculties into as yet undeveloped areas by deliberately abstaining. That kind of stunned me when I read that actually, mm. that it was abstaining mm. was the key area to open up new things. Stop relying on what you're relying on which you're was amazing on. for me to read right from utilizing the already developed faculties okay so only then by abstaining can a new integration come to pass so what does that really mean when i read that i was like wild because i'm thinking a lot of these spiritualities talk about well your true self or your original nature is full but you've overlaid this whole thing of like choosing one specific pseudo solution, right? Or one specific mm -hmm. area, one specific solution to things. So it's, it's basically developing that already by this point in her on this. Um, so only then a new integration can come to pass. God is both with, with both of you. Okay, now that was the first time I realized that there was a man in this whole yeah, problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then as I'm reading, I'm going, well, wait, what's this difficulty? Yeah. And suddenly it's like, oh, he... It says your man, okay, okay, should also use this advice. Oh, it's not John Pirapo, is it? Which no, one? I think it was no, this is way, way back. Way yeah, back. Okay. yeah. It, it must have been way back. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I will not give words about this crisis, <laughs> which I loved. I laughed so hard when I read that because so many times I've written also with my higher self, and it's like, no. I'm not going to validate your bull crap or whatever it is. I'm not going to talk about your crisis. I'm going to focus you on what you need to focus on. You know, like that's the truth of it. So when I read that, it made me just chuckle. But I, you know, I sh uh, what is it also here? Okay, so I will not give words about the crisis. It is but a speck of dust. <laughs> it is for the good of all. Gain your new faculties. This is all for now. <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing. I'm so happy you found that. Yeah, um, that was. Wow. I really <laughs> felt the feeling of holiness. Honestly, when I yeah. when I picked oh, that up, I felt like, whoa! Uh, you feel the energy. This is like, uh, right? Energy. It's beautiful. When yeah, you can see her budding. Actually, partially, you can see her just learning about what's what she's going to be or yeah. what she's going to allow the guide to come yeah. through. It's amazing. This is a picture of her. Uh, 
I'm not sure if it's about that time, but uh, let's see. Second here, I can move it over. Can I, you see that picture? Yeah, quite a picture. Oh, this is young. Wow. Pretty beautiful. You can see how spiritual, even that picture, you can beautiful. see the spirituality right there. And that. Well, how old do you young. think she is? It's almost like saintly looking. Very young, man. Yeah. I mean, what, 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 this is, uh, this is, this is much later. This is, um, this was a boyfriend of hers. The well, bikinis are great. <laughs> this was here, her on her, the terrace of her apartment in Manhattan. Oh, there my, she is. One thing about Eva, she's always worshiping the sun. She's always lying down getting tanned. Oh, right. <laughs> always. Wow. So it's full of life. It's wild. Beautiful. Yeah. The one where she's dancing as well was phenomenal. You sent her out or whatever. Her <laughs> leg was up and she was doing her yeah, pirouette yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So it was like, wow. There's another amazing picture that... Uh, I want to find, let's see, uh, let's see, these are, hold on a minute. It's quite wild there. Now look at this one. This is, a, this is amazing. This is, this picture. Yeah, yeah. Wow. She is getting sun Look at her. This is her. Oh, man. I don't know how, how, uh, hold on, let's see. Size. Can you guys see, see this photo? Wow, that's that's so beautiful. This is, yeah, you guys can see this. Look at her. She's and, uh, gorgeous. <laughs> and you know, this must be from the like late '30s, early '40s. And believe it or not, on the other side of the uh, photograph, it's written in their trance. What what it says in it. In German, in their trance, in, in, the, in trance. the trance. In the trance. So she's lying she's, down, looks like on a diving what? board. Her yeah. eyes are closed. Mm -hmm. And I just feel this like serenity. Yeah. Right? That was before she was channeling. Much though, before. You guys can right. see it, right? Do you know the time frame when she was channeling? I kind of <laughs> forgot the history of it. It's 1950 to 1970. Well, the, the first lecture was Original. delivered in 1958. So yeah. I think that these experimental with automatic writing and channeling, I guess, happened in the 50s. Um, yeah, so this was way back, wow. Yeah. This is yeah. very touchy, I have to say, you know, this, this kind of period. Yeah, and, 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 and that's, it's, it's very powerful. What I'm amazed at with the path work alone, I've never experienced this with any other, is to watch someone become a channel and to see what they've done like I read some of the earlier stuff, but it's amazing because when she's she's opening herself up to the guy, it's it's like watching the process almost each time when you watch when you listen to her talk. It's it's really amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's very deep. It's a unique experience. You don't really receive that very often. So it's it's a blessing. Well, it's also beautiful. It talks about even even whoever she speaks to, they are also learning. So it's us again, it's us, it's infinite yeah. process. Yeah. No matter what it is, it's everybody serving everybody. It's an infinite evolution uh, of whatever. Yes, to create this kind of again uh, unity or uh, yeah. 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 And it's so it's so amazing. Yeah. So again, it's on, on yeah. the level of the individuality, yeah. she talks about the different parts of emotions, cognition, physicality, yes, but at the level of the cosmos with other people as well. Yeah. If you look at one of the later lectures, she'll talk about entities that are not, let's say, fragments like us, that are made up of fragments that all roll up basically <clears throat> into larger entities, right? And that have many different incarnations that are existent. And some of the, especially the unedited Q and A's that I've read, and it's amazing to listen to because you let. Some people were like. <laughs> and laughing like it was amazing to them to hear such a thing out of her. But I think that's really what she was tapping into was these collective energies, right, that exist after we stop incarnating here, mm -hmm. okay? And once we go to that place, we also make up, let's say, that next, whatever that level is. And that level also still needs to learn. And it's learning how to serve, right? It's learning how to serve others that are also in need. So, you know, once you choose your path of service, no matter how it's expressed, I think it, it, it continues. 
it's not only just here in the earth world you know that's, that's what i that's, really that's very deep yeah you know what i mean just one thing mutual yes oh, yes yeah I think, I think your laptop needs to be plugged in. Well, I, uh, it's never I saw the little red. Um, <laughs> good catch. Good catch there, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, well, everyone. So this has been wonderful sharing tonight. Um, shall we have our meditation? Yeah. Can we hold Barbara, though? Barbara's husband. And oh, yeah, Barbara. Thoughts. Let's let's do Please. that. Yeah. All right. Barbara, Bill. Yeah. So let's let's have a healing meditation for Bill. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. And Barbara, anything you'd like to say about him? He's not going to bring any present. Burning him. What they said, Lauren. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, I don't know what to say about him. I mean, it's just, <clears throat> he's just so much who he is. And that's what I've always loved about him that, um, you know, just like no bullshit, you know, <laughs> just, you know, there he is, you know, and um, <clears throat> his, you know, he, he thinks so entirely differently than I do. And he just would always, uh, and it's not like, you know, sort of like be true to himself. It was like, just like, that's it, you know? And I, um, I don't know. I just, I guess I feel like I just want to, um, I'm not sure what it is. Just sort of like be there for his journey. And I've lived through, you know, his fading now for, you know, more than a year to even, you know, slight. And I guess for myself, it's just, I feel so much that I've been really blessed to have loved someone so much and still love someone so much and feel that I've been well loved. Amen. So let's all send Bill our light and healing energy and love. <clears throat>